Hi everybody. Just thought I'd uh, give you a, a quick overview of some uh, simple socket programming, but before I do, I wanted to review the OSI model and uh, talk a little bit about client server programming. Maybe give you a practical demonstration. Uh, so recall the OSI model is the Open Systems Interconnection model, and that's from ISO, the International Standards Organization, and it gives us seven layers. There's the physical layer, which is bits, the data link layer, which you could call data link processing data units, but in typical fashion, it would be something like P2P protocol, PPP, some people would call it. And sometimes they use PPPoE, which is PPP over the Ethernet. Uh, next comes the routing layer, which is also known as the network layer. Uh, that's where you have um, IP or internet protocol numbers, and on top of that layer, uh, they use a transport layer, which some people would term TCP IP, which is the transport control protocol on top of the internet protocol. And uh, that is a transmission control protocol, which controls flow. Then comes the uh, session layer, and uh, that's when you would proceed to uh, uh, do logins and such. Comes, next comes the presentation layer. That might be hypertext transfer protocol or internet interoperability protocol or uh, common object resource uh, broker administration or remote method invocation or database network. So for example, you could use a, a special protocol for communicating with SQL databases and um, that would enable you to uh, get data in a uh, result set from an SQL query. And then comes some application which essentially is the uh, user face, right? That's the part you, you, that you face the user with. And that could be your browser, and that'll render onto the screen. Uh, so then there's this thing that people call a domain. And there are different things that go into a domain. Um, Top-level domains, TLDs, uh, are like edu, us, com, gov, .net, any um, country name uh, that um, is abbreviated with two letters. Uh, I think um, there are perhaps 450 top-level country domains. And certainly you could get your own top-level domain if um, you become a country. Uh, you could probably buy an island and declare yourself as a country, and then the United Nations would recognize you, and voila, you'd have your own top-level domain, which is probably not a bad idea um, if you have the wherewithal. Uh, domain name systems map domain names to IP addresses. So .java is a um, secondary domain. .com, that's the top level domain. Uh, reverse lookups or, um, or lookups in general are all done by the service known as domain name uh, services. And so in Windows, there's a special thing they call the hosts table. And under Windows 95 and 98 and ME, I don't think anyone still has these things, it's under C colon Windows hosts. But if you go to Windows NT or 2000 or XP Pro, and I don't think anything anybody has these things anymore either, uh, it's uh, C colon WinNT system32 drivers at C hosts. And then if you go to Windows XP Home, they changed it again. Or did they? I don't know. But anyways, it's, it's still uh, system32 drivers at C hosts. I don't know what Windows 10 does. Somebody here may know. Uh, on a Mac, it's different. Um, it's um, Etsy hosts. So, um, for example, uh, here's my uh, uh, terminal window, and I can go to Etsy, and I can say more hosts. And you can see I've got a little list of um, hosts that are available to me on my little local area network. So, for example, um, I might like to uh, ping... Um, the moon. Let's ping the moon. And there it is on 175. And you can certainly see that it is listed here in 175. And it's also listed under show. And in fact, it's my web server. So as a, um, a result, um, you can have your own little domain name server and you can do it inside of your own local computer. And it'll take priority over all the others. That might be very convenient if what you're trying to do is set up some sort of a local printer with a um, Ethernet presence, or perhaps one of the Internet of Things, if you just have an ad hoc network that you're setting up on your own. 
So then there's this question about socket programming. And this is where I think a lot of Java programmers uh, reside. They reside in what's called um, the TCP IP protocol um, uh, programming suite. And so that gives us a what they call stack, and that's a uh, like an OSI stack. Uh, and we use the transport layer by opening up a, um, a IP address with a difference. And the difference is we also have a port. And so when you do socket programming, you have to know about a port. And you use the port um, like dialing an extension after you've dialed the main number. So you can dial, you know, some main corporate office building, but then you have to put in the extension to get to the actual phone that answers. And so that creates a connect. It allows you to do a transmission and reception. You're also able to do a disconnect. And essentially it allows for um, inter-process communication. So then the question becomes, you know, what do I need it for? And the answer is if you're building a web server, uh, if you're doing any kind of distributed computing with RMI, remote method invocation, or internet inter-orb protocol, uh, there's um, concurrent computing, uh, there's network computing, virtual connections, basic communications. So the ports, what do I need them for? And the answer is <coughs> every service that runs, every um, task that runs inside of um, an operating system uh, will be listening for connections on a specific port. So your web server runs on one port, uh, time and day runs on port 13, uh, simple network uh, uh, management uh, protocol might be on uh, port 25, mailed, mailed protocol, you could have uh, port 80 do the uh, web service port, and in fact, uh, if you go to Etsy services, you can see the ports in Unix. Uh, let's see what happens here if we go to Etsy services. CD slash Etsy, more services, and sure enough, there's a bunch of ports. Uh, they've been assigned. Looks like uh, port 13 is assigned here using RFC uh, 869. And once you have a port like that, uh, I know that NIST has a port for um, port 13. And we'll use a, a client called Telnet to get into uh, port 13. So it says here, port 13 is using daytime protocol using a request for comment 867. So we could probably Google that and read it, but let's take a look and see what happens. So it makes the connection very quick and comes back and gives us the uh, the date, gives us the time, uh, tells us it's universal time code. And so it seems like we have a uh, mechanism to get date and time. Now, if the local host were running such a service, we could get the same thing. But connections refused because localhost is not running that service. If Moon were running the service, when well, we already know we can we can find it and ping it, but it doesn't run the service. So not every machine is going to run that service. These guys run it. And that's very interesting. And we could write a program to actually get that that service. And in fact, let you know, let's let's think about how we might go about doing just that. So um, here's an interesting idea. Um, this is a server. I'd like to write a program that actually goes out and gets the day and the time. So let's see what we can do to make that happen. So here's a um, here's a little program. Uh, we'll use the host name as seen before by the um, by the telnet command. And it was very nice to be able to prototype that. It's uh, time-c.nist.gov. So we're getting time from an atomic clock. That sounds like a good place to get time. Uh, and then um, then you can print out what the time is and what the host source was. And uh, we'll use this little uh, method that we've written that returns a string. And that uses this daytime port. Uh, we will open up a new socket, right? So we talk about socket programming. This gives us a, a TCP IP uh, protocol um, communication path to the host using the daytime port, port 13. We'll create an input stream 
and then uh, a string buffer which will build up from data that we can um, extract from the input stream. And then we'll read the um, data one character at a time until the uh, data is uh, exhausted. We'll append it to the uh, string buffer and then we'll return it. So that's a very convenient thing. You can call it from anywhere as long as you have a good host name that you can get response from. And now if you run it, in theory, it should give us uh, the date and the time. And there it is. So that's, a, um, that's an example of um, getting a service from the uh, network, in fact, from the internet, and um, might even be useful for you so you can get the date and the time. So that's, uh, that's our first example of socket programming. Thank you.